Let's move on from that and talk at the US session overnight. US manufacturing activity accelerated, topping expectations in August, growing for the third straight month. Let's get more. Larry Shova, Chief Investment Officer at Efficient Advisors, joins us live via Skype in Chicago. Larry, always a pleasure to have you on the program. Thanks for joining us here at AusBiz. Um, just give us your view then, because that manufacturing number was pretty strong. As we said, third straight month, and we're watching it continue to rise. How much has this played into markets or what's going on in markets and the bullish sentiment there completely separate? Yeah, you know, it was actually influential. I mean, for months, like data really didn't matter because we chalked it up to it being stale. Uh, right now, it does seem to matter. And ISM, as you mentioned, really blew out expectations on just about every front. And so, again, it's another scenario where it's a buying opportunity for people um, in duration with Treasury yields being up where they were, people buy uh, treasuries, they're also buying stocks, considering and knowing the fact that um, if something goes awry, uh, Powell or Philip Lowe will be there to be very aggressive. So to see a pullback in the short term is highly unlikely in my view, but all that to say, I'm paying a lot more close attention to data than I was even to it. Yeah, we talk about that and we, that, you know, comes into mind with payrolls coming out this Friday. And I was just discussing this with our prior guest because it seems, well, you know, even just when I'm looking at payrolls numbers for the last few months, I've been like, yes, I know they're bad, move on. But now it seems like the focus is back on. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. We're back on because I don't think we would have had the move we had today, but wasn't for ISM. And I think that begets or at least puts a lot of pressure on the upcoming non-farm payrolls report. Um, but even um, around that, you know, what we have to keep in mind is that at least in the short term, there's this faith, whether it's well-grounded faith or not, that the Fed or the central bank uh, in Aust RBA in Aust Australia will act and act decisively and act quickly and pull levers um, at their disposal. At their disposal. So um, that won't happen forever. But for now, that's the base case. So. Um, when you look at upcoming numbers like non-farm payrolls, it is very important to pay attention to it. But on the other hand, I just can't uh, see a case or make a case for the market to really crater, given the fact that the power put is in place. How will continue? I mean, this this power put, as we talk about, or um, I guess the faith that the Fed won't hesitate to offer more stimulus is certainly in place, right? I mean, this stimulus will continue for a long time to come. You just look at the GFC um, and how the response was to that. This is a very different um, crisis, I guess you could say, than what went on in the GFC. It seems like we may need this for the long term. Yeah, um, and long term, definitely a different story. Because like right now, this market, I mean, even though you know, we have rebounded, uh, you know, probably faster than we have um, even in 2009. It still resonates a little bit with 2012, 2013, where the market um, went way ahead of where the data said it should go. And so everything is so dependent on you know, economic data and also the pandemic. I mean, as goes the pandemic, so goes the market. And I think that's the way uh, we should be strategizing. We're investing right now with that in mind, with the pandemic. And I believe uh, the market is just you know, con deeply convicted that there will be a vaccine and, and we'll have normalization in the labor market sooner than later. And so I think that's what the market's telling us right now. I know everyone talks about the tech potential bubble and what we're seeing in tech. And you look at Zoom overnight, it's already made huge gains during the year. I mean, in terms of being uh, having tailwinds, I guess you could say, from what's going on with the COVID and some of the structural changes from COVID. But to see Zoom up 40%, I mean, it's just insane when you look at that. But then I guess people are buying it. What, what do you make of this tech situation? Because I'm sure you get asked about the tech bubble um, a lot. Yeah, absolutely. And and my answer, actually, since like 2012, is that um, are these are these companies, are these stocks expensive? And I say on an absolute basis, they are. And I've been saying that ever all the way back to 2012. But on a relative basis, they are not. And perhaps still, you know, an attractive valuation relative to everything else that's out there, especially government bonds and or some of the other sectors of the market. I mean, when a, when a small sector of the market gets so hard to purchase because it seems so expensive, that's sometimes a telltale that it is still a value. It's just that human nature just stays away from it because of the valuations inside the stock itself. 
Yeah, it's an interesting one. Um, I guess when you look forward as well, I've got to ask you about the election, Larry. I mean, how does that play into it? We know that there's never a sure thing about who's going to win. We've seen that time and time again. Um, so, you know, it's anyone's game, I guess, at the moment. What sort of impact do you see on either uh, president getting in? Yeah, so um, I have to rely on history because that's all we have. And like the, the difference between the two candidates seems to be vast. And with that in mind, that would be get much different scenarios in the market, at least from a common pedestrian viewpoint. However, when you look at history, that doesn't seem to work out. It just seems like the pres president's impact on the stock market is a lot smaller than we give credit to. And again, that's just using history as a guide and nothing else. So um, I believe the market's almost discounting who wins the election more in favor of the pandemic and the normalization of the labor market in the U.S. and also around the world that seems to be the number one priority. Yeah, well, certainly one we're watching closely. I think the whole world is watching that one closely. But Larry, just before we let you go, I want to talk about the earnings season that was, some of the earnings we've seen, because mostly finished, but we've still got some retailers um, to go there. And I guess retail has been a particularly interesting space, uh, given how the pandemic's hit confidence, but also on the flip side, how these companies are adapting to the e-commerce or online um, retail environment, I guess. Talk us through uh, what you're watching, particularly Macy's, Guess, some of these stocks. Yeah, and so Macy's, uh, in my mind, yeah, a great old company with a lot of real estate, and they probably, uh, it's probably trading at a discount. But I personally, just as an investor, I wouldn't touch it because I want to go after companies that have embedded within them a priority to online exposure, one that is uh, selling like their own products with high margin, like especially clothing and also are like fast to market. And Macy's is none of these. I mean, they're trying to play catch up. They do have a vast amount of um, landscape around the US, but that said, I prefer to go with companies like Boohoo or in 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 Dendex, uh, who both have been around for a long time. They make their own clothing, high margin, fast to market and online. So that's where I would go. And I would just stay away from any company that, that continues to rely on brick and mortar. Larry Shover, we always love talking with you. Thank you so much for joining us here on AusBiz today. Thank you.